And now, church, I would ask that you would, if you have a Bible, I would ask that you would turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, where I'll be reading verses 5 through 9. And I would ask that you would stand as the word is being read. Please stand with me. Chapter 2, starting in verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him, who made him for a little while lower than the angels? You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we have seen him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned him with glory and honor because the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So we continue through chapter this this book of Hebrews and so far we are by the end of today we will have gone through a chapter and a half of this book. Only 11 and a half more to go. 12 and a half. 11 and a half. Math and public. We are getting there. It is a glory. It is a weighty book. It is a deep and difficult book. And yet, it is of the most importance, I believe, for our church and the churches today. For it deals with a message of perseverance in the midst of suffering. If you, if you recall call where we started, we started with the title of this book. It's called To the Hebrews. And this is written to Jewish converts who likely converted to Christ in a Jewish setting. And then what we see here later in our text is that they came across some serious persecution. Chapter 10, verses 32 and 33 especially show us the weight, just the the amount of persecution to the point that they were willing to leave Christ and to find another path, that, that Christ somehow wasn't enough and they needed to find relief. And so the author saying, understanding that they were tempted to turn to their old ways of the Jewish religion, to go to the old paths, to the old ceremonies, to the old sacrifices, to the old temple, with all of its shadows and forms, and say that is sufficient. But the author is saying, no, no, it is not. Last time we were together, there was the first of six warnings that we see in this book. It was pretty heavy. It was, it, was a, it was a hard text to deal with. And it is a warning of don't keep, keep your eyes on Christ lest you drift. That there is a reality of drifting in the church and that we need to pay attention. Chapter 1 revealed the glory of Christ, the supremacy of Christ. It, it showed, it laid out in a sevenfold, this crescendo of who He is, why He is better That He is the full radiance of God displayed to humanity. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. And He alone has been given all authority to rule and to reign over all creation. In short, Jesus is superior to the angels, which is His first comparison, because He's God. To prove this, He then went in and He showed us in seven texts. Seven is such a recurring number here for some reason, but there are seven reasons for why Jesus was this. Seven Old Testament texts in chapter one, all showing Jesus is God. He is superior to the angels. It ended with Psalm 110. And Psalm 110 is a text that he's going to use again. The author is going to go back to Psalm 110. This is the most quoted Psalm in all of our New Testaments. And it says that he's better because he's seated at the right hand of the Father, that all the enemies are being put under his feet. He's showing that that don't go anywhere else. Christ is one. He's he's victorious. No other place that will, there's no other place. He is superior. He's putting his enemies under the feet. But this now begs the question, 
which is what we're seeing here in our text today. Okay, if Jesus Christ is one, if all of this is true, then why am I still suffering? Why is there persecution if Christ is victorious? Why do the enemies seem to win? What is going on? This is what today's passage will answer, and it will answer it again like this author always does from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not just for the Jew. The Old Testament is for the Christian because it is, it is the story that God reveals and the full revelation of the New Testament explains the Old. We do not discount the Old Testament because it does show us the reality of who we are and what we are called to do. There's comfort here today. There's comfort in understanding of who we are in our situation. But there's also a challenge in this text. It is a difficult text as well, much as is a lot of the book of Hebrews. The realities of the gospel is it's filled with grace. But there's a seriousness to the consequences of rebellion that we see here today. So we're going to look at a somewhat of a reset a reset maybe of our minds and understanding of really of getting a perspective on the grandness of Christ, on, on our King and where He is, the realities of what we face, of who He is. But we're going to do it in a way that hasn't been to this point what the author has been doing. The author has shown the grandeur of Christ in Him being God. But today, He's going to show the grandeur of Christ in Him becoming man. And we're going to see as we do this what our role is, what our purpose is in this. So the sermon today is following three points. First, what is humanity's purpose? What is it all about? What, are we, what were we made for? This is where the author goes back to in answering the question, showing them as to what is going on in their situation. He then will show the problem, the distance between what we were made for and where we are now. And then he will finally, he will wrap it up by showing the solution, which is Christ and why Christ is better. So let us now, let us now turn to this and look. And the, the, the argument actually comes, if, if you recall, he's been dealing with a comparison with angels, that these Jewish converts were looking to angels as some solution apart from Christ. Those who brought the law, those who shook the mountains when Moses comes up. The, these angels, not like what we think of angels, but how they thought them. And he is saying, no, Jesus is better. Listen to what verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 13 says to get context to today. It says, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make, my, you, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? This is what the context is <clears throat> today. So now, let's now pick it up in verse 5 of chapter 2, which says this, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. He says that it is not to angels that God subjected the world to come. He's making a point that Jesus is superior. He's pointing to these Jewish Christians. Again, we need to be thinking as a Jew, and we tend not to do. As Americans, what do we think? We think in time right now. What am I getting right now? I want it right now. This is, uh, my situation is, is hopeless right now. But to a Jewish person, they didn't often just think of the here and now. They looked not only to the past of who they were, but they looked to the future of the promises. And they looked to God saying, why aren't I getting this, what this, this looks like? And so what we see here is the author is explaining to these Jewish Christians this idea that Christ is over the world to come. That is, that is, Christ is over the, the day of the Lord that is coming. He is coming to the time when there's a new heaven and a new earth. He's, he's over the picture of what has been painted in Isaiah 65 and in Revelation. That, that things are going to be reset. It is a time when all the promises, everything that God has laid from Genesis 3.15 onward, fully revealed. The world to come is that time when everything is made right. And so from the, on the onset here, we are told to remember that our inheritance is not in this world. It is not in the here and now. It is not what we're seeing around us. This is the present evil age, it's, de it's described as. But there is one that is coming that has been secured to Christ. The world to come, 
of which is speaking is the heart of this letter. What he is saying to these Jewish Christians is remember where the promises lie, and it's not right now. It's not here. Whatever you're going through right now, this is not the end, and this is what it starts with. It shows us this. It shows us, and now what, we, it, what he does is he turns to the, to the future, but he still looks, that's, that's not the point of all of this. It's not just, there is a time that Christ is going to set everything back. He answers and says, look at now. Look what you were made for. And so what he does is he starts them to understand their purpose. And that begins in verse 6. What were you made for? What is your purpose? Who are you? This is what he answers. He says this. It has been testified somewhere, and that somewhere is Psalm 8. And it is not that the author doesn't know where it is. So this is a Jewish person writing likely. When he says it is said somewhere, he's just highlighting the importance of understanding what the Bible is. It doesn't really matter that we quote the section and verse so much as the authority comes from Scripture. And so he says, it's been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection to under his feet. We want to run to Christ as this is, well, this is clearly speaking about Jesus Christ. But to the psalmist, it was speaking about you and me as well. Our purpose is described here. So let's not just run to Christ on this. Let's understand what's being said by looking at what we are being called to do. That this is our dignity. This is your dignity. This is what you were, you were called to do. But if you ask your neighbor, what is the purpose of humanity? I don't know if you've ever done that, getting big ethereal questions like that. I don't know how you know your neighbors, but you know sometimes it's fun to ask these kind of questions. Why are you here? How would you answer that question? How would they answer this question? Typically, if they're not believers, they would answer in two ways. They would answer it either by saying, well, we, and they wouldn't say it like this, but this is what they mean. Humanity is the ultimate standard. Whatever is good for the majority of people is where we find our truth. So long as it's good for society, that is the standard. And our purpose is to make the least amount of people suffer. To take away pain. There's another side, another answer, if people are honest, many times they're not, but this is how they live, that they would say that there's really nothing distinct about us, that we have no purpose, that we are just made a little bit above the animals, that we can speak and we have our thumbs that we can use that are a little better than the chimpanzee. And so really, at the end of the day, hmm, Our purpose is just to eat and drink and be merry. For tomorrow we die. And there's really nothing in us that has any dignity other than the power that we have to get what we want. This is the world's way of thinking about our purpose. Think about this. If you've ever heard of Stephen Hawking, this is what he describes humanity as. This scientist who was very respected. The human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet orbiting around an average star in the outer suburbs of one of among a hundred billion galaxies. We are so insignificant that I can't believe the whole universe exists for our benefit. This is the world's understanding of our purpose. And we face this, and the problem now, I in our society is they're they're ramming these two ideas together to make a super heresy, a super challenge that we say we're both the measure of all things and we're worthless. That it's our standard, but it doesn't matter. It's all relative. There is no truth and there's no hope and you have no purpose and you have no dignity. And so this is where we are left. And this is where we come to today where we have the idea that you're born with one sex and then you can change and you can become whatever you want because there's no standard. It's all based on what you want. We've come to a place where the idea of thinking of of a standard that's above us, honor, dignity, that is not what we strive for. We strive for our own personal pleasure. 
our own personal, whatever is best for you, you go do. Versus what am I made for? What is my purpose apart from myself? This is a challenge. But our text here doesn't think like the world. We do not think this way. We know that there is dignity in man. In all humanity. We know this because the Bible tells me so. Because we see it here. The standard that we see, which Psalm 8 does quote, it does go back to, is Genesis 1.26 and following. It says that God designed us with a purpose from creation, from the beginning. That we were to reflect His glory with a crown that He gave us, and we were to rule all of creation in His place. We were to put everything in subjection to God. That's our purpose, to be God's image bearer, to be his crown. We are all made this way. But then the fall happens. And does that crown go away? Does the image of God get thrown out with the fall? No. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells me so. right? Because it says in Genesis chapter 9 with Noah, when Noah comes and after the flood happens, when every human being but eight are wiped off of the planet, which we paint on our children's walls, which I I think is great, but that is, we don't paint it like that. (laughs) That is not how we... But the idea of the flood and God's judgment and God recreates through Noah. And he says the same thing that he told to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful, multiply, subdue. That is the purpose that that, that they were created for to take the crown, to to subdue the earth in a way that is to the glory of God. So after the fall, Noah is told to do this. And it says this, even greater, it says, and it talks about the first capital punishment of a society, is that if there is any murder, this is to take place. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For God made man in his own image. So the reason that there is to be justice in the spilling of blood if someone else spills is because you and I and every human being out there is made in God's image with a purpose. And the purpose of man is to give God glory. Do we think this way about our neighbors and our enemies and those people that annoy us and our loved ones? Do we think this way about the people who we cannot get along with They are made in God's image with the purpose to glorify God. This is what C.S. Lewis, I've quoted C.S. Lewis a few times. You can tell I do like to read him. Uh, Although I am a strong Presbyterian, I will read Anglicans. And he says, he says this, we must remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else you would be a horror of a corruption, such as now you would meet only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or of the other of these destinations. In light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe of circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another. All friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. But it is with immortals whom you joke and work with and marry and snub and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. This is who we are. This is man. What is man that you are mindful of him? This is what we see. We need to reorient our thinking about how we see each other how we witness to one another, how we look to those whom we disagree with. They're all made in God's image. But most importantly, and I think many of us need to, we need to look at ourselves and understand who we are and our identity more than we do. You need to see who you are as God sees you, what you were created for, to be image bearers. And do you earn that position? Did you do anything to say, yes, I am good enough to represent you. Can you see the, the grace and the, the splendor of who God is in choosing us 
mere creatures to represent him. This is the purpose that God made us for. This is to represent him to, um, hum- to the world, to shape the world. This is what it says in verse 8. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, that is man, he left nothing outside his control. This is the lordship of man at creation. I say man because of the Hebrew text Adam. It means men and women. It means humanity. This is our purpose. God made us to reflect his nature, his love, his perfection to a world. But now listen to the second half of this verse and look with me at the problem that we see with humanity. So the purpose is to reflect God's glory, to be his image bearer. But now we look at the problem that we see here. It says, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. If there was any other understatement in the, all of the Bible, I, don't, I really don't know where it would be. I, I think that this is probably the most understated text. We just don't see everything in subjection to him at this time. This is the problem of the human race, that we're created to have dominion, to reflect God's glory, to be his image bearer, and yet we don't. And there is nothing that we have in us to do this. This is a pretty fair assessment, I believe, of the world around us, is that we do see a world that is not in subjection to him. We do see a world that is, uh, is broken, and it is full of sin. If we were to look and just think about some of the ways in which we look at creation and see, are we, are we taking it in subjection? Are we, are we bringing it into, into the glory of God? We do our best to predict, predict weather. I believe I'm being told that there's a weather storm that's coming, that, I, that, that I'm going to hit when we drive back home. And Lord willing, that's, that's not true, but we shall see. But we do our best to predict weather. Are we always right? No. I don't believe we are. Food supplies, water sources, basic shelter. It's outside of of humanity in in reaching to to many in this world. People are starving, they're bleeding, they're crying, they're suffering all over the globe. And we can influence weather, we can provide, but it is not the picture that we see. We can't even control ourselves and our passions and our own thoughts. The image we display is tainted, it is tarnished. It is a poor reflection of God's character. So what happened? So what is the difference between what we were called for and what we see now? And where does that go? Well, we saw in Genesis 1 our purpose. If you just keep reading in the early chapters of our Bibles, you will see what happened. In Genesis 2 and chapter 3, we see it all went wrong. We see how Adam rebelled. And in that rebellion, he brought all of humanity, all of us, into a rebellion. You see, God made a relationship that was binding called a covenant. And he made this covenant with Adam as a representative of all humanity. Because if you ever wondered, well, it was Eve that did it, not Adam, right? Wasn't it Eve that cast? Why don't we blame Eve? For Eve, all of, all of the sin came. No, because Adam represented humanity in a covenant. And in that, it said there was the covenant which we call the covenant of works. And in that covenant, God made promises and he made curses that, Adam, you can be fruitful, multiply, subdue. And you have at your disposal all of creation. Just don't eat that fruit. If you eat that fruit, what happens? You die. That's really the it. That was, there was a stipulation, just don't eat the fruit. Just don't eat it. And so we see, uh, as we read through this, that, well, that Adam and Eve did rebel. That God gave them a sufficiency to not do so, but in their own free wills, they chose to rebel. And in so doing, bound our wills and everyone after into sin. That we are enslaved to sin. That there is a depravity of all of us. That there is nothing that has been tarnished. There's nothing that has been freed from sin. That's what total depravity means. It doesn't mean that we sin as much as we can. It just means that everything about us is sinful apart from our faith in Christ. 
So this is, this is where we are then. Genesis 3 tells us what happened. The ser- serpent deceives the woman. And along with Adam and all of humanity, we all go and we're all broken. And while well, our image is not taken away, it is still there. It is just impossible for us to actually do what we're called. This is the problem. The problem is, is that we're made in God's image, but we cannot on our own reflect God's glory because we're sinners now. And we have no hope. But God doesn't end there. <laughs> that is, he could have. He could have just walked. And by his glory, he would have been fully justified in condemning Adam and all humanity. Because he says, if you eat that, you will die. And that's justice. But in his mercy, immediately after the fall, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the snake, and I'll raise for you a son. And this son is going to come and is going to rescue my people. And you may bruise his, his heel, but he will crush your head. And that is the promise of Genesis 3.15. And the whole rest of the Bible is going to be talking about that. And what a, what a glory that is. But we still, we really don't understand the problem. We, in the way, if we could understand the problem, then we could really under, start to understand the solution. But here is the problem. This is the hard bit, is that the covenant of works is still in effect. That when Adam broke it, he didn't throw out the covenant. We're still responsible to give God glory. We're still responsible to, to, to obey Him. But we're not able to. And that's the problem. That God in His justice must keep the covenant of works. But in His justice, He must punish rightly us who can't keep it. That is our problem. The great theologian Mother Goose said this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty together again. So no matter what we try, how how much duct tape we get, how much glue we try and put, we cannot put Humpty Dumpty back. Humanity is cracked. It is broken. And as we look... We don't really understand this problem. The world certainly doesn't. What does the world say the problem is? It's the ignorance. We just don't know. If we just knew more stuff, if we just had more knowledge, then we'd be good because we're good people. So let's start giving everyone cell phones, access to the internet. That's the solution. Well, maybe it has to do with our childhood experiences about our dysfunctional environment, the environment around us, our systematic cultural suppression, they say. So, social engineering, that's the solution. Let's do that. Poverty. If I just had enough to eat, if I just had enough to buy whatever, whatever standard that means. So, let's redistribute income. That'll be a solution. How we look at the problem looks to how we look at the solution. And the world sees the external. It sees everything around as the, as the problem, and the solution then is fix the things around. But church, the problem is the, it's the heart. that It is the sin that, we have been, that has been put on us because of Adam's representation of humanity. And without any hope, that is the place where we are. That is the problem that we have. It runs so much deeper than we understand. We are in bondage to sin. And if I'm the problem, if my sin is the problem, how can, my, how can I be the solution? How can you be the solution if you're the problem? You can't. That is right. But we see here in our text, and it continues where the solution is. So we've seen our purpose. We've seen the problem. Let us now look to the solution. The solution is Jesus Christ. You knew that was coming. Jesus is better. You see that Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father. You see that all enemies are being put under his feet. And what we see here in our text, and let me read verse 9 for you on this, it says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned him with glory. So now we're switching. Psalm 8 was dealing with man, and now we see Psalm 8 is dealing with Christ. And in all the Psalms, this is how it goes. 
It is dealing with us, but it is also dealing with Christ because all of the Bible is about him. So we see this. It says, but we see, he, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The solution we see here is Christ. In the fullness of time, we see what Christ has done. So what we see here, there's really three phases that I want to show you here is the solution. That this, that this story of what Christ has done. He's done, he's worked progressively to get us to a point where he is the solution. And it gets to the point of answering the question of why is it still so broken? Why am I still suffering? First, it says here, look what it says. It says, for, for a little while, for a little while, he was made lower than the angels. And when was this? When was Christ made a little lower than the angels? When was he humiliated for us? This speaks to the incarnation. This speaks of what Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5 say. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that they might receive adoption as sons. When it says, who are you, O man? What is man? It is that Christ became that. And, and the author of Hebrews, this is very difficult to, to be sure, the author is going to spell this out in greater detail. He's going to work chapters to explain how Christ, in his manhood, comes to save as the God-man. But he introduces it here. And he says, for a little while, he was made a little lower than the angels. He submitted himself. He emptied himself from the glory of God, as it says in Philippians 2. And he comes and he takes on the form of man. And he is born of woman, born under the law. That he suffered the death, it continues. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. He came to atone to pay for your sins. Jesus Christ did not come as an example to just live. What would Jesus do? Well, he would walk on water. Good luck with that. We, he is not just an example for you. He is your substitute. And when we see that, we see the problem is that Adam and his covenant with God, the covenant of works, is still fully in effect. We can begin to understand what Christ did in dying on the cross as a substitute, as a second Adam, to pay, to, to, to satisfy the covenant of works for you. This is what we see here in what is going on. For a little while he did this. He suffered the death so that by the grace of God, God he might taste death for everyone. He doesn't just drink it. He fully downs. He drinks fully the cup of God's wrath for you, is what it says. For everyone, well, it will go and it will continue in the book of Hebrews. It will say, not everyone, in the sense that we are thinking. It's all whom God has chosen. Because it speaks later of many sons, of brothers, of children who are given to me. It says it in just the next verses. Verses 10, verses 11, verse 13. So that everyone that he came for is all that he has been given. All that turn to him. By the grace of God, that is a key element. Because we can't do it. Because where, what's the problem? You're dead in your sins. What's the problem? You can't fix it. You got nothing. The only way for you to be right is for Christ to come. He's better. And so this is what he does. And he comes by the grace of God. Without anything that you have done, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for the grace of for by grace you have been saved through faith, not because of your faith. Through the instrument of faith which you have been given, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, that not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. What a glory of the grace that we see and the love that he shows you and putting you back to a place that you could fulfill your purpose, that you had no hope to do, apart from what he has done. Becoming man. What is man? that Christ would take that on for you. And what is God's response, which is the second phase, which is the resurrection. So at the incarnation, he's humiliated. He has come and he is emptied. 
But in the second phase, he is, ex- he is exalted and he is resurrected because it says here that God crowned him with glory and honor because of the suffering of his death. Because of his perfect obedience, God glorifies his son by giving him a crown. And that is what we read in Psalm 110, that he sits. What happens when you sit down? We talked about this. The priests, did they sit? There are no chairs in the temple because it's always repeated sacrifices. You never get to rest. Christ rests. Once for all, he sits and he says, it, I am finished with you. I have saved you. You are mine. What a glory! This is what we see here. So we see that the, the purpose that we have is only to be found when we look to Christ. This is what Psalm 110 says. This is what Psalm 8 says. This is what the whole Bible says. That there's death is no longer victorious of those who are in Christ Jesus by faith. And even now he reigns. And even now he's eternal. So, okay, I get it. What about the world that we see? Why is it still suffering? Why? That comes with the third phase. So the first is the incarnation, advent, incarnation. The second is resurrection. And the third is his second advent, him coming again. When he comes again, all will be made right. And the problem that we have is that we look to this world in the here and now as Americans And we think that's all there is. As long as I can have what I want and I can take away any suffering and pain that I have, that is what Christianity is all about. No. It is in the the pattern of crucifixion, resurrection. It is in humiliation, exaltation. How are the big words we want to use? Suffering to glory. However we want to look at it. This is the pattern that we see here. This is what is going on here in all of this. You see, Christ made a way for Humpty Dumpty to get back on the wall. It's just we can't always see it if we just look around us as the only standard. If we, like Ecclesiastes, like Solomon, look look under the, that there's nothing new under the sun. If we keep our eyes down, then yes, there is no hope. Because of this world, Satan reigns. But we have to look to where he is and what is going. We have to see the victory that is Christ spiritually. We have to see the already, not yet. I don't know how many other doctrinal phrases I can throw at you today in this sermon, but this is a big one. The already, not yet. That that Christ is already one and yet not yet in what we see because it's coming in the next age, the age to come, the next world which has begun at his resurrection but it is not fully complete. So the new heavens and new earth that is promised and all of the, all of the victory and all, that, all the judgment and there's no more tears, no more suffering, that is coming when Christ comes again. And so what we see here is in the already and the not yet, how we answer this question about why am I still suffering is because God is still working in a fallen world to save sinners. And we need to keep our eyes on the ball, if you will. And not look back to anything else, but to look to Christ who is right now reigning and right now ruling, who has initiated this. You really have to ask yourself, what kingdom, what world do I belong to? What age am I in? Do I find my security and my peace in this present evil age? Do I find security in what I have, in what I own, in the resources in my bank? Is that where I find my security? Do I find peace in the health of my body? Is that where I'm supposed to? Is that my joy and contentment? As long as I'm not suffering physically, is that what I'm called to do? This present age? Or do I look to somewhere else? Do I look to that which is to come? To where we will be face to face with God forever praising Him? But there's never a time when we would not be doing what our purpose is, which is to reflect His glory back to Him. What age do you live? Everything is ours already in Christ. Everything. It's all yours, though it is not fully realized in our experiences. And that's what faith is, which we will see in chapter 11 of this. That faith is that assurance of things that we do not see. The things that we are hoping for, but that we do not see. 
we will see this in a, a chapter 11, Lord willing, if we keep going to what we'll see. If you live in this world, you will die in this world without hope. And nothing that you will have will fix whatever your purpose is. There's nothing external that can fix it. So don't look back and don't look anywhere else. For you will have no satisfaction and you'll have no contentment and you'll have no joy. Look to Christ who has freely offered himself to you. This is the pattern that we see and this is what we do. Pick up your cross before you pick up your crown. Why is there suffering? I don't know. I'm not God. I know that He is ruling and reigning right now. I don't know why you're going through what you're going. Or I don't know why you're not suffering. But I know that He's reigning. And I know that He is there for you. And I know that He has, he has made a way for you to find your purpose again, which is to worship and glorify Him. I know that. And you should know that too. So church... Don't look anywhere else. Jesus is better. Let's pray. Father God, it is a humbling thing for us to hear that you emptied yourself, that in the fullness of time, that is in your plan, that you knew you would be coming, that there's nothing of a surprise to you. Father, that you made a way before you were, we were even created, that you knew who we were, you knew that you would come for us. Father, that in your loving kindness, before we were born, you died for us. Father, I pray now for those who don't know you, that they would fall on their face and they would turn to you in the free offer of salvation to repent and believe. Father, I pray to you for all those who have done so to live as though that is true and to look not just to our circumstances, Father, but look to you. Look to where Christ is. Look to where he is right now. Father, I ask that for those who are suffering, that we as a church could walk alongside them, that we could love them, and that we could grow with them. Father, we ask that you would help us to see the suffering in our church, that we can do this, that we don't hide it. Father, you have done this so that we can grow and walk, walk with you. This is not a Pollyanna church, Lord, where we fake it. Father, help us to see the reality of who you are for the purpose of what we are made for so that we can glorify you. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name and amen.